<laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. It's okay. We're, we're in the same boat. Yeah. But Toby, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I think I've been trying to track you down for about four or five months. We've been trying to get a date and a time arranged. So we finally got it sorted. It went without a hitch. No technical issues whatsoever. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad you've made some time. I know there's a, a bit of a time difference, so it should be uh, morning time or, or afternoon time for yourself. For me, it's like a good time for you. You're actually putting yourself to work now, mate. You're actually working right now. Like doing the late night podcast is like, that's work, you know? Good if, for you. If only work was this easy. Yeah, exactly, man. Dude, like I, I, I saw a couple of the um, the chats you had with the boys, that, that my, my, my boys from my old band and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just awesome that you were like, you know, I, I get to see them through, you know, that vessel rather than me being like a band or whatever it is. It was really cool to watch you guys like connect like that. It's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've, I've still to get Dale on. Uh, he has got back to me though. And yeah. he's happy to come on, but I've still to arrange a date and a time. And I actually had j on again yesterday with his new band. Yeah. It's awesome. They, they put a song called, I think it's Bridges. Is that what they're Yeah. I've got, yeah. got on the phone and that. So yeah. Then I've been advertising it across central Scotland, blasting it out the car, the car stereo when I'm driving about. <laughs> it's all like, like the Blues Brothers, when they put the big speaker on the top of the car, they're like, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. But uh, Toby, we're going to talk about everything, right? So we'll be at four or five hours and then we'll be done. It's absolutely okay. fine. Yeah. But uh, what I like to do with, with all the guests that come on is go right back to the very beginning. So for yourself, where were you, where were you brought up? So I was brought up in, in Melbourne, like not uh, pretty much the same city as, as Tommy and Dale. I'm very close to where they, they grew up. My parents, are, is, uh, they're English. So I was, my dad's from Portsmouth, my mum's from Wrexham. Right. Um, but I was talking to my dad last night, actually, and we, he has Scottish heritage. So he used to wear kilts for certain ceremonies and things like that. And yeah. I told him I was talking to you today, and he goes, we've got to go back there because... He's getting really old and we have to go back to the motherland and like, mm -hmm. and just investigate. I've never done that with him, but we were talking about that. But they kind of, they were the, the, the boomers who Australia was like trying to build like an infrastructure and they went to Cambridge University in Oxford and said, well, we need skilled people to come to Australia. And yeah. that's what mum and dad did. And they had three boys. I was the youngest. So I get to like skate through life and just yeah. enjoy, enjoy everything. And my other brother's just like, well, you're a little asshole, aren't you? So, yeah. I, I, knew, I knew that your dad was watching this. I, sh I should have worn my full kilt. I know, exactly. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's most stereotypical, but I do actually have a kilt. Um, you, but, you should. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I should wear it when I'm doing gigs. It'll maybe attract a better clientele. And then just like, and do the high kick like this where you just, and then it's just nothing but yeah, just, star yeah. jumps and cartwheels and stuff like that. Yeah. So you're brought up in Melbourne. Yeah. Were you music when you were a wee kid? So, yeah, so my, my mum's a music teacher. So she studied like, you know, uh, she was in the Welsh choirs when she was growing up. And we all know the Welsh choirs are some of the best in the world, if not the best. And she taught like you know piano violin singing and all that kind of stuff and so that was in like we were always in choirs when i was growing up and then it wasn't cool to be in a choir so yeah. and then my brothers started like rock and roll and so my two older brothers were actually probably the coolest band in town and i was like i want to do that but i couldn't and and i remember sitting out the front of the by morris pub and watching them through the window because i wasn't allowed to get in Right, and then I was allowed to get in. Then he would get like Simon would get me up to sing, and I would I would jam with them. And that's were you were you influenced by your older brothers with the type of music that they were listening to? Yeah, it, actually, in a way, I was. And then you know, like I think it's like anything. You know, like you probably know when you're growing up, you someone shows you an, a record or, or tunes you into a song. So Simon was a big Talking Heads fan, like David Byrne. He he loved. Um, you uh, too as well and things like that and so I was attracted to that more you too actually probably and then uh, and Tim was like uh, Eric Clapton Stevie Ray Vaughan so my two older brothers they they mm -hmm. had different if I walked you know knocked on their door I could hear different kind kinds of music so yeah. I was kind of lucky because I, I got like a a hodgepodge but at the same time yeah. 
I, I think I discovered music through them. And I didn't discover it myself. Does that make sense? Because I was yeah. what they were listening to. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask, normally I'll, I'll ask people, was there a certain age that you discovered your own musical taste? Because there's a lot of people will, their, their parents will be playing music. So that they're, they're into music growing up, but you get to a certain age where you discover something for yourself that's not from your parents. And for myself, it was, my, I, I always remember this, you know, I, I was listening to a wee bit of like U2 and mm -hmm. bits and pieces like that. And uh, just stuff that my dad was listening to. And then my friend came down one day with a, a copy, it was a cassette tape, and it was Metallica's Master of Puppets album. Oh, shit. Okay. And I, I, I was 10 years old. Yeah. I had no idea what it was, but I was like, there's something about this, I like it. Yeah. Of course, you collect your pocket money, and you go out and you buy an album, you make a copy for your friend, and then he gets an album and makes a copy, and you start to build it from there. But um, give us a wee laugh then, Toby. What was, do you remember what the first album was that you ever bought with your own money? Holy crap. That, that's an awesome question. Because it was like, we had like, like you said, we had like bootlegging like cassette tapes. So we'd just like share that. I think that the era of, remember when like, uh, so uh, in the early 90s, like bands like Pearl Jam and Green Day, if you went to school and you didn't have those records, like in your backpack, you, were, yeah. you weren't cool, you had to buy it, you know, and they were probably like 20 bucks or something like that. Like it was a decent like price for like a record yeah. like that. So I think that... But, the one, the one thing that stands out, like obviously I had records before that, but, but remember Vitalogy by Pearl Jam? And it had a booklet. Album? It had a booklet in there. And, yeah. and you could read all the like, like inscriptions and, and things yeah. like that. We were like at school going, what? This is incredible, you know? Like, and so I remember those things like vividly. Um, it but was I yeah. cool though because... Again, I've spoke with previously with, with people about this that, I mean, I think you're a few years older than myself, but we're both in our 40s, yep. so brought yep. up at a similar time. And you go back to the 80s and the 90s, you still had music shops, for starters, before yep. they all started to close down. But you would go in, you know, if you had enough money and you would flick through the CDs or, you know, whatever you're looking for, you would maybe buy an album based on the artwork alone because the artwork was important, yep. it looked cool. Yep. And... Uh, but you would maybe only have 11 or 12 albums at home. So you studied those albums inside out, including the booklets and the words and everything, because you, you didn't have this unlimited supply of music, which you have nowadays. Yep. So, so you knew bands a lot better. And as you say, you're looking at the Pearl Jam album. Yes. And I bet you, you would have known it start to finish inside exactly. out. Exactly, yeah. And, that, and that's the issue that we have is like people, like you said, like you're a musician and I am too, is like I'm used to putting out like a, a whole product of something, not yeah. just like a single here and there. And, and so like when we started our first band when I was like 14 or 15 at, at the high school, we would play like, you know, like Civil War from Guns N' Roses. We would do like uh, It's Strange. We would play um, uh, like... Nothing Man from, you know, from Pearl Jam. Like, all the yeah. songs that we, we liked, but other people are like, what the fuck are you guys playing that for? Why aren't you playing the hit? But we were playing because we were hoping that people would connect with the B-sides, I guess, yeah. like we did. You know, like, um, there was a song, like, uh, um, Party Girl by U2. Like, a, there was a girl, her name is Party. Yeah. And it was like, no one really knew it, but we used to play that. And... Mm -hmm because we wanted to promote like those weird songs that no one knew about. It was like, it was our secret that like, why are you playing that? We don't, we want to hear like the hits and we're like, but back in the day you could just do whatever the hell you wanted because people were there and they were engaged. Now it's like, you have to be ADD proof. You know, you have to like play two minutes and then get the hell out before they start walking away. You know what I mean? And then that's, yeah, it, it, mm. that's a shame because, uh, it depends what, what generation of, that you ask. Mm. I would imagine prob probably from maybe 35 down the way, they've got a very different view on 
music and overall package compared to 35 plus. Yeah. And uh, it's a shame because as you say, you know, I'm, I'm still in the mindset of, I, I still like the idea of an album. Yeah. And but the artwork that's very important that goes with the album, you've got the track list and you, you can't just put the 10 songs on, on any order. You've got to have it start with this song. It's got to lead yeah. into that song. It's definitely got to end with this song. And, and that's completely dying now because of the way that music is accessed. And it, it, it's a shame, but I think that's maybe just the world that we live in. And I understand now why bands will just release singles or they'll maybe do an EP because yeah. um, you can do it every few months. You can keep people interested. Mm. It's almost like there's not an appetite for the album, but I think there still is, though, depending yeah. on what group you, you, you speak to. It, 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 no, it definitely is. And I think that, like, I had this conversation with, with my bandmates, whatever band I'm actually working with at the time. We're not trying to conquer the world. We're, we're trying to, like, give something that, like, I'm sitting on so much music and everyone's like, well, it has to be done this way. And, like, I'm so fearful of putting it out because <laughs> back in the day you could just, you felt confident about putting something out because you felt like it was just respected that you, like you said, like a body of work was respected. Yeah. Now it's like you're judged on every fucking song. It's all also, it seems yeah. to be forgotten very quickly. You know, nobody's got any attention span these days. Yeah. But you do. Apart from me and you. Yeah. And, and we're, and we actually are out there. You know what I mean? Like, and it's like, that's why, I, that's why I say to my bandmates to go, let's, let's not try and like, m one of my mottos is that I'm not trying to change your life, but I'll, change your your mood like now you know i'm not i don't think we're trying to conquer the world and, it, and and that's when your best product will happen when you're not trying to be something you're just putting out what feels natural you know the, the best best story i've got recently of this scenario with new technology and the way music is accessed is i've got a friend who was on a previous episode and he spent a year recording this album yeah and it was my my other friend who's the, the sound engineer. He, he recorded it for him. And he spent a lot of time doing this album. He got the artwork that went really nice with it. He wanted to have CDs made along with having it available for download and streaming. But he wanted to have something that he could hold in his hand as well, which yeah. is really... And the masters came through. He got it sent off. He got the CDs back. He went over to my friend's house, who the, the one that mixed it and recorded it, and he said, I've got the album. How does it sound? I don't know. I've, don't, I've not got a CD player. <laughs> no shit. I know. And people were like, I hope you release a CD. I'm like, what for? Like, what, like what, how do we, you know, like, which is like what we thought of vinyl in the 90s, you know, and now we're looking at CDs like, what for? But And you don't even have a CD player in the car anymore. It used to always be at least that was in the car. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, but but this I think that for the fans they just want something you know what I mean yeah they and I think that like when I when I get uh, feedback from people that that hear my new stuff what they're like I hope we can hold it you know even if they don't play it they they kind of just want to have like a, like some sort of validation of like that's yeah for, you know, and that's what is different and vinyl is now becoming like popular again but it's very like strategic you know like it's only you don't print 10,000 vinyls it's, yeah. it's like a very catered like a hundred vinyls for this one particular reason you know so but vinyl over here is massive at the yeah. moment however part of me thinks is it a a passing sort of phase will, will it you know in five years time is it still going to be as popular but I mean I went into the, there is a few music shops still left and mm. I went in just for a wee wonder, and uh, there's, it is cool picking up the big album covers, and you're you know if you're looking at them, they, they look really cool. But the reason that CDs went out was they were so expensive, and I mean you were talking over here maybe fifteen pound for a, a CD. Yeah, I, I was looking at records, and the cheapest one I could find I think was thirty pounds, so it was double the price of a CD. Yeah, but. And I'm just like, who's going to buy? I don't know who's going to buy uh, that it will continue as a business to grow and grow and grow. I think it's you know it's good to now, but I think in the next 
10 years, I don't think it's going to still be around the way it is just now. Well, the, the thing that I think with, with vinyl is that it, it's, it's a conversation as well. Like you have to get up out of your seat like every 15, 20 minutes mm-hmm. to turn it over. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's about spending time with people. You now you go and flip the record. You know, it's about us actually enjoying our living room, mm-hmm. listening, and the, ro- the the romanticizing of it, like our parents yeah. used to do. Like, and I think that is, I think why it's so popular is because it is. It's a talking point. It's like, oh, it, let me just you know flip it over. You know, like whereas yeah. like you put something on Bluetooth, you can just press a button and sit in the corner and. But there's something about getting out of your seat, turning yeah. it over, engaging with someone. That's where we have to hope that people want to do that. Just just so long as you don't scratch it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you do, you have to go, wah, 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 wah. you have to do like the Beastie Boy shit and then you have to get like fully done. Yeah. I always, always remember my friend coming down with his, his first ever CD and he said to me, this, this is amazing. you know." And he went through to the bathroom and he ran it under the tap and then he just wiped it. He's like, look, this is in- indestructible. <laughs> you drop the thing and it, it starts skipping. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it's so awesome. And it's but, like 30, they're 30 quid down the drain right there. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you brought up your mum's music teacher. You've got your older yep. brother who are influencing you. Yep. Um, did, am I right in saying then was singing your first instrument? Uh, yeah, I think singing was, yeah, in choirs. And then... Um, you know, growing up in Australia, we're like the like apart from Britain, very number one sport orientated. You know, like, and so what happened was I kind of like was told by my peers that singing in a choir was not cool, <laughs> and and you know playing piano wasn't cool, which mm-hmm. is like one of my biggest regrets. Like I wish I just said you know fuck you because um, you follow the trend of your peers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, I continued singing, but my, and this is like a, a story that I, I tell every now and again, which is like, it's kind of dark, but it's also like probably the most pivotal moment in my life. When I started playing in bands, because my brothers did, and then I, I, I was like fanning the flame. I think I was like 16 or 17 years old, and I was playing all the, like the proms, like the after parties and stuff like that, yeah. and then playing sport on the weekend. But I wasn't, you know, like a leader or anything. I was just like, because my parents weren't like a, a leader. They were like very frugal and just like very hardworking. Whereas mm-hmm. a lot of my friends were like their parents would just throw, hey, 20 bucks, go and get it, get yourself a pie and like the whole world, you can have it, you know. My parents were like, you earn, you know, every cent you get kind of thing. Yeah. And so when I was double dipping playing sport and then playing rock and roll, they, my, my peers thought that I was like, you know, taking the piss. And so I actually got beaten up at a party one night by – my close friends. And that's when I chose music over sport. And I okay. rode my bike, I rode my bike, bike home that night going, I, if, if that's what it means to be an alpha male or whatever it is, what they're trying to do, I don't want part of it. And music was the reason why I continued that path. It's funny, yeah. funny to hear that because similar kids growing up, the big thing in Scotland's football. Yeah. And, and, f- I loved playing football, but what happens is you play it throughout primary school. So from however young up to about the age of eleven, you you can just you'll just play it as normal. And then what happens is you go off to high school, and it's all of a sudden you've got to join a team, yeah. and that's you can't play it just for fun. It's it, it's becomes serious, and that's when I lost interest in playing it because that's when I also discovered music. And I was just like, you know, people screaming and shouting, chasing a ball about, and I'm like, nah, I think I'd rather just rock on the guitar. Yeah, that's it, you know. And yeah. it's, it's like it's such a balance because we, I, I love sport. Like I absolutely adore it. But it's like when it comes to like having to kind of like square up and be a, a dick, I'm, I'm not all about that, you know. Like yeah. it just – it was one of those things. My dad was a, a soccer referee and so – he 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 actually was the oldest referee I think in in Australia. He's like he's that guy. He's like he, he's he's known for actually sending off the most people in one game. You know, like he has. There's a picture of him with a red card sending off the whole fucking team. But yeah. he he loved the discipline of it, and I enjoyed the discipline as well. But but I think music for me, 
the discipline is only there there are no boundaries it's like it's just a open free will you know the problem the problem that you have in scotland is a uh, such a big deal mate the, the two main teams rangers and celtic right. yeah yeah Protestant Catholic, and you know, at, even to this day, it's there's still problems, like major problems, with it. And even going to, like, I play a lot of the pubs, mm. and I just avoid it. Any any songs related to football because it still causes problems. Wow, every single week. Yeah, uh, to the point that it takes almost take, spoils it. It takes the fun out of the music because you can potentially have hassle if you. <laughs> play the wrong song to the wrong person. That's the incredible. Because you had like Ange Postacoglu who had success over there in Scotland, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then now he's doing Tottenham. But, and then my favourite player, well, one of my favourite players from Liverpool is Andy Robertson. So he's like a the captain now of Scotland. But mm-hmm. as you say, like, yeah, isn't it incredible? But, like, but the thing, there's something actually kind of like, what I miss, what I miss about America, is that the community is not not like that. There's something cool. I, I know it's like a problem because it's like, but there's something really cool about the passion that a country like yourself oh. has. You know, but pe- people being passionate about a sports team that they that they support is is brilliant. But the problem you've got here is that. It, you can't just support them. It, it's, it always causes problems. Yeah. And I mean, you couldn't if you were to go into Glasgow, you couldn't walk down the main street with a football top on because you're going to attract problems. Wow. You know, and it, it's a shame. But anyway, that's kind of how I, I kind of, yeah. <laughs> went, sort of went towards music and. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. I love but, it. Uh, obviously, I would imagine. When you're playing in bands mm-hmm. uh, at high school, are you just singing, or had you picked the guitar up by that point? I was singing, mate. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I don't call myself a guitarist at all. You know, like okay. I, I've been blessed with like the best guitarists. You know, like when you, when you get Dale on your show, he is like one of my favorite guitarists in the world, and people will tell you that as well. He's. I'm just blessed to be around great guitarists. I, I, if I do play guitar, it's purely just to fill some sort of little gap. Um, what, uh, what's fun, Tommy had said to me that, you know, you just need to listen to Dale. He, he's an outstanding guitarist, but he says his, his, his confidence levels are zero. He just does not believe in himself, and he says it's the most hilarious thing ever because he'll smash it out on stage. Everybody's loving it, and he yeah. said he'll come on stage and he'll just be like, Oh, I wasn't sure if I was good or not. <laughs> he's like, but the, he's so humble to a to a to a point where you just want to like put him in some cotton wool and just take him everywhere you want to go. He's the fucking he's the man. But because yeah. we, we used to, when we're on like I'm I'm going to name drop, but when we're on tour with Slash, for instance, he would like Slash would stand side of stage and would gloat, you know, and be like, "This kid's got soul," you know. It's like it's like to me it was. I'm trying to like assimilate things, but remember when Bono worked with BB King and and BB King's like, boy, you got, you know, you got soul. Like, and it wasn't like, it wasn't like trying to show off. It was just innate. It's inbuilt. Like he is naturally gifted. I mean, the thing with Dale though, just from purely from someone just sort of watching and listening. I mean, technically he can do some fancy stuff on the guitar, but he's got feel. He, He listens you know, it, 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 some of the stuff he does, it doesn't need to be technically amazing. He can just bend a note the right way or, you know, that's the one thing. Some guitarists, I mean, Dale would probably say there's a million guitarists out there technically better than him. Oh, yeah. It doesn't make them a better guitarist, though. It's the way you, you make love to the guitar, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you need, to, you need to also play for the song. You know, you, what you're playing makes the song better. Yeah. You know, it's not about making you look get the spotlight on me, you know. Are, are you a guitarist before a singer? I've played guitar since I was 10. I'm 42 now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, did backing singing, if you can call it that. Yeah. Up until, well, this is a funny story. So I had done it pretty much that whole period of time. I then... Uh, when 
lockdown happened and COVID, mm. uh, I had been playing in a duo, uh, doing the lead guitar and backing vocals. The other guy was doing rhythm and main singing. And everything in Scotland, like the rest of the world, closed down. Yep. Uh, I switched over and thought, I'm just going to go and start doing the, the rhythm guitar and I'm going to do the singing. And then I just took it from there. But what I'd been doing is I had been recording for rec writing and recording. So I was doing singing, but it was in the comfort of my own home. I wasn't doing it in front of people. And then it was when COVID happened that I actually switched over. And then once we came out of COVID, started booking gigs just for myself. So it's, it's really only maybe two or three years that I've actually been singing, like yeah. proper or singing well I, I mean because like we're buddies on like on facebook and yeah, yeah. You know, if my space was around we'd be best friends but it was like I, I i keep up with you you know and you actually i i saw your transition or i saw you like your evolution and i well, think that we all evolved through that period of time like uh sebastian who's one of my best friends out here i, I say he's like the go-to guy if you want something if you need a drummer a guitarist or a bass player. He does everything really, really well. Is that, the guy, is that the guy you've done a few Facebook Lives with? Yeah, Sebastian, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He's coming on. He's coming on the show. Bloody hell. Well, there you go. He, he's, he's, I can't remember the name of his band. He's coming on. I don't know called if the Alibis. Yeah, I don't know if I've got a date and time arranged, but I have spoke with him. Yeah. And he is, he's coming on at some point, maybe in the next month or so. He's like... So he's like a little brother to me. His father is like a, an incredible, like he works in the industry for 40 years as a stage tech for all the big bands in Australia. And Seb grew up as an 11-year-old. He was a prodigy drummer. Oh, and right. now, he's playing, now he's playing bass with his father's bass that his father's brother had gifted him and sadly passed. And now, so, but Seb was always a drummer, but now he's a bass player. So like for you, what the evolution of what you do with music that's what mm -hmm. i love about it it's like <clears throat> in, in like football for instance a center forward's not going to play center back you know what i mean like it, everything is but with music there's an evolution where you can just be open to i was talking to my daughter last night like full disclosure i'm a little hungover because i was talking to my daughter in, in australia and my father and we we're talking about what is her passion and she goes well I don't know if I want to be like you, Dad, because you wear like weird clothes and, you know, and I'm like, just, you know, I'm like, Grant, <laughs> that's okay. Androgyny is fantastic. But I said, you've got a great voice, but there's opportunity in music to just like blossom and, and investigate, you know, and that's what I love about it. Like it's interpreted in individually to what you want it to be. Whereas, you know, like I love sport as well, but it's very, if you want discipline, Let's go into sport. But I think the music, the discipline's not as, you know, because it's free. It's freedom of artistry in a way. But the other thing you've got to think about is if, let's say, for example, when you were a teenager, instead of going into the music route, let's say you went down the sport route, you'd have already had to retire by now because you'd have been yeah. old. So, yeah. you know, music, you can still be doing music when you're 90 years old. Yeah. But, you know, when you're... When I was 30, I think 32 or 33, I felt like everything was like coming at me. Like I have to do everything. I have to be like the best in the whole world. And when you realize you don't have to like, you know, chase youth or whatever it is, yeah. it's, just about, it's just about being good at what you do and being actually believable. Because some yeah. of my favorite artists are like in their 60s now, you know, and mm -hmm. and inspiring to me because they're, they're – recreating and, and things like that so it could also be a way of me saying well i'm old and you know that's <laughs> a, my, you know i'm just talking shit but but i that's what i'm saying like whatever i do now i'm not trying to change the whole landscape of of the world i'm actually just doing things because i want to do it you know but it's funny you'll say about how music um it's got something for everybody and it, you know it can take you out of dark times and all that sort of thing but mm -hmm. someone this kind of leads into sort of Duke Cartel, but some, yeah. well, it was Tommy had, had said to me, how do you know Toby? And I'd said to him, well, I says, I don't really know Toby, but I says, well, we've kind of 
talk back and forth a little bit on social media for years. I, I can't actually remember when how, it started. Yeah, yeah. But I said, but like a lot of people, uh, I says I, I became aware of Toby because of a uh, rock star supernova mm-hmm. TV. Oh, and this is the weird one because I was listening to you talking to Mark. You and Mark spoke a lot about yeah. uh, Rockstar Supernova. He was on The Voice. And I'm a big rocker. I, I don't know what happened in 2007, right? Nobody I know has ever heard of the show. Yeah. Or the or, or obviously the band or anything like that. Yeah. I, I felt like it was this little secret that I was the only one that, that discovered it. So I kind of looked it up, and I know that the show was filmed in 2006. Yep. Like, towards the end of 2006. But it, it definitely, it wasn't shown here in uh, in Scotland until 2007. So I think... Oh, wow. Because I, I was aware of the, sh- the show the previous year when In Excess were looking for a singer. Yep, yep. And I really enjoyed the format of it. This was long before X Factor and all these kind of shows. So I liked the fact it was rock bands that were playing with a live band. Yeah. Um, you know, it was like a live setup. You, you had an audience and all that sort of thing. And then being a rocker, it was like, oh, Jason Newstead, Metallica, you know, that's my band. Yeah, you've got Tommy Lee, you've got Gilby Clark. They're looking, yeah. they're going to create this super group. They're looking for a singer, but it's the same format of the show as the previous year. Mm-hmm. So I was like, right, I need to watch this. And to cut a long story short, what happened was I'd been in a long-term relationship and, you know, child, house, dog, cat, everything, the whole thing fell apart. And this was at the start of 2007. And uh, I had to move back to the parents' house to, to regroup. So I think I was about 25 at the time, feeling quite sorry for myself. Right. Uh, and it got to the summer time, and the parents went away on holiday. So I was sitting in this house by myself, and I'd obviously been, I'd almost got to the point where I'd stopped playing the guitar, um, just because of of life. And I heard the show was coming back on, right? So I sit down and I watch it, and uh, you know, I think it was like fifteen or sixteen people that it starts with. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, fifteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So automatically. You watch a few episodes and you go, right, I, I like this person. I'm not that keen on that person. And mm-hmm. Two or three people that, that you think, right, if I was voting, this is who I'd vote for. But I think all that, I think it must have been a delay because all the voting must have already been done. I think the show was out the previous year, uh, like maybe four or five months prior to it being shown in Scotland. But um, obviously that's how I heard of yourself. And... The funny story is, it's when you got the opportunity to showcase an original song, mm. you done it with Throw It Away. Yeah. And you, you know, you did an edited version of it, but also it's, it's so catchy that, that, that watching that song, it sort of picked me up and picked the guitar up, started playing it again. And I'm not joking, I, I wrote a whole album based on the on that song kind of giving me a kick up the arse. Like that energy. That's Yeah. That, so the, yeah. the album that I wrote, you know, it didn't sound like the song, but it was in the same sort of vein. It was just like it inspired me to get mm. back into playing music and, and that's how I kind of uh, that's how I kind of discovered yourself. And then I must be the only person oh, What the fuck? I must be the only person in Scotland that has that did I send that to you somehow? Who well, sent that to you? Well, this is what I said said to Tommy was th- this was two thousand seven, so Facebook wasn't really a thing then. It's that that CD we were giving out when we like so we supported like Nickelback, right? Um, yeah, yeah. At Rod Laver, like that was like our big kind of thing for us, two thousand and five, and so our band was getting steam with that EP, and we yeah, were yeah. like. We literally stood outside the venue and people like just so, took everything we had. Yeah, I'm being honest. I can't even remember how I got that because there's no barcode on it. You couldn't go and put, no. there, wasn't like, there wasn't an online shop. So the only thing no, we, were I, just, we were just throwing them out, you know, like with yeah, no fucking the, yeah. The only thing I can think is you, you guys must have had maybe an early website, and I 
must have contacted it. And I think that's maybe how we got in touch. That's it. That, holy crap, dude. That's like, we're talking 16. <laughs> that's, that's in 17 years. That's so funny. <laughs> But, but the thing I, is, the thing is, like, like I want to get back to that that song, throw it away. Like I, it, it, like the, for me, it was kind of, um, I write songs that are internally, like, getting my inner monologue out, you know. And so <laughs> that that song was um, when we kind of like put it all together as a band. We felt so good about it because it was like it encapsulated everything that we wanted to do was like, man, why aren't we living in the moment? Like just, you know, get all that, you know, bad juju out, whether it be drugs, alcohol, women, whatever the fuck it is, get it out and, and let's just fucking enjoy life. And uh, I think the more the older I get, the more it means more to me actually. And yeah. so for you to like not – you said your, your record doesn't sound anything like it, but for you to actually get off, you know, out of your slumber – and then able to, that's that's kind of what my feedback was. It was like the, the, everyone was saying, like the people that I met because of the show were like, you just seem to be like a pos- positive energy and you're like, and, and I was, I was nurturing all the drama, you know, and I was like, I was watching like my, my, my dear friends, Luca, Lucas and Delana, like, like they were like freaking out. I'm like, man, we're having the best time of our lives. Yeah. yeah. See, see- See, looking back in hindsight, what was the show as it came across? Or what, I actually, it's on YouTube, and, and yeah. I actually watched a few episodes again just to kind of re- remember. Mm. And I don't know if it's because you, I now know what the outcome was. You know, Lucas was the one that won it. But looking back on it, and it might be the way they edited the, the episodes, but. It seemed obvious from almost from the very beginning that that's who they were going to pick. Lucas, yeah. But yeah, there's some people that they were a definite no, and then there was people like yourself that it was a wee bit, you were, you were kind yeah. of on shit. But I don't know if you if you guys have got, um, there's a reality TV show that gets shown here called Big Brother. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, people go in a oh. house and try and become famous. And... It disappeared for years and years, and then they brought it back last year. So what happened last year was they got a lot of the old contestants from previous seasons oh, just shit. to think what what happened to them, and they come on and they tell their story and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And there was one of the guys had said that because it was the same format, you know, you would fo- you would phone up to vote for who you wanted to to evict from the house. Yeah. And he had said that when he he was one of the the favourites. But he got he got to like third place, like third place or something. He got evicted, and he said that one of the producers that he'd spoke to afterwards had said that the actual voting system, the other person was voted to get evicted, but they evicted him because it made for better TV. So with that in mind, do you was the show as legitimate as it was made out to be, or do you think it was it was kind of already? sort of decided regardless of what you done? Yeah, I, it was, I definitely thought that Lucas was, I, even I was like, I felt, even I was like, the more that the, the season went on, I was like, dude, you should sing for this band, you know, like. And I'm not yeah. taking anything away f- from Lucas, but when I was watching it again, like, you were, like, I, there was a, there was an episode that came out before it started and it was the guys, Jason, Tommy, Gilby, talking about the idea behind it, just, just as a sort yeah. of treat for it. And Jason Newstead was so up for it that you know this this is a this is a band. This is we can do things with this band. We can take it around the world. We can create this new music. And then when it started, it was very much a TV show rather than this is going to be a, a new magical band. And I yeah. think that. In the end, it did. It did end up like that because the band. Yeah, I didn't. I well, really Jason, think. Jason, like he opted out. You know, I think three weeks before the end, he was. He was checking so, out. <laughs> yeah, he broke his shoulder like lifting down a bass amp. You know, like, but he he lived across the road from the mansion we were staying at, and he would come over when the cameras were off and hang with us. And I was like, "This is the 
I go, this is the guy I want to work with, you know. Yes. Gilby, Gilby would like turn up and, and, you know, like love Gilby. I still see him around town and all that kind of stuff, but uh, he's not a lead guitarist. And then, and then Tommy was, his ex-wife was dating Kid Rock at the time. You know, it was like, it was a <laughs> calamity of errors. And we were just like in the middle with Mark Burnett going, did you practice your, you know, your, your elimination song? I'm like, I thought like, I thought I crushed it, you know, like, yeah, yeah, so there was some strings that were pulled, but, but, but genuinely uh, the connection that Tommy and Lucas had, because Tommy was the star from the band, like Tommy Lee, he was, he was like, he was the, the, he was the the ratings kind of guy. And Lucas was drama. And those two had like a a beautiful kinship that I was like, I was almost like their third best mate. And I was like, this is fucking awesome. You know, and I had no issues with it because I mean, like that, that, yeah. the best thing that, in my opinion, that ever happened was that you didn't win it, mm. but you but you done exactly what you Tommy said that you said to all the guys. We are using this as a platform to launch Duke Cartel. Yeah, I had I had I had a dog tag with Duke Cartel. Yeah, yeah. On the whole show, like and and yeah. like they, I remember Tommy saying that they were a little insecure at times. Um, because they were doing interviews back in Australia going, how do you think, you know, because like it, the show blew up in Australia, it became huge. Like it, yeah. it won like all these awards for like the most watched show and all that kind of stuff because I was just flying this Aussie flag and just saying, fuck, and let's go, whatever it yeah. was. But they got a little like insecure as like, oh, is he just leading us on? But I was always thinking my band's better because we've been together for like 10 years. Like we, we know how to play music together. These guys don't even jam, you know, in the studio. They don't care. You know, yeah. Jason, but, cared. he, re- Jason, you said a- actually cared. But yeah. I mean, I, mean I, do, I, do, I do remember there was a, I do remember watching it going, you know, when you would do a song and then they would get their opinion on how your performance had been. <laughs> there was, there was a few times that, uh, it, it, it just turned into a TV show because there was a few times Jason was actually trying to say something important. Music, musically important and he was completely shut down. And you, I can remember thinking, if that had been me, I would have been having words with them the minute the camera was switched off, like, don't speak yep. to me. You know, and uh, it, it, it was a TV show. It's just, it blows my mind that nobody else is, is aware of it. Around here, well, I don't but the, the, yeah, in your country, I, like I understand that. I think in Britain as well, it was like it was it wasn't like a big show, um, but it's huge in South America, huge in Australia. Yeah. Like uh, obviously uh, Iceland because of Magni. So when we actually we went and did like a reunion show, like in two thousand and seven, it was like I went to a mall and it, I had to have security to like to cart you out because he flew this Icelandic fat. Uh, flag <laughs> and here we that this is going to make you laugh but I've been in contact with Magni so he's going to cut he's going to be on at some point <laughs> come on mate <laughs> what are you doing mate you, you're like you're hanging out with all my best friends I love it that's great he is like I love man he's like one of my favorite humans he's awesome and you know what he goes he goes I can't believe you fucking beat me and I'm like yeah he said he said I'd sent him a, a message, you know, would you, would you like to come on? The same message I sent yourself. Mm. Uh, he'd, he'd message back saying, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to come on, but can I ask one question? He says, what is it? And he says, why me? And I'm like, what do you mean, why you? I was like, mate, I was like, you're this, you know, a great singer, good yeah. songwriter. You're in Iceland, so you've got a completely different perspective on things from over here. Why would I not want to, to hear your take on things? Yeah. He's like, I swear to God, he's like, he was a man even before he was a boy. Like, he's, he, he was, there's something, his charisma and, and like, you, you know, like um, someone who, 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 who's a dad before they, they become a dad, like, you know, just that old soul. Yep. But super fucking talented. But Magni, yeah, yeah. He was, Magni was that guy where it was just like, while, like, I, I, I'm like a, a social butterfly. Like on the show, I'll just like, you know, just, I could just be like, I could attract the energy and like disappear if I wanted to. Yeah. I actually wanted like some sort of like real talk. 
Magni, you know, like, and we would just be like, yeah, man, those guys are being dicks. Let's just, <laughs> let's go over here. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you know, so, yeah. So going back, how did Duke Cartel start and what age were you when it, when it started? So we, we were in a, a cover band before that. Um, I think we started at 18 and we were doing like, from 18 to 23 or 24, it was like six nights a week, you know, just doing this. Yeah, just, just, and then we changed our cover band name to Duke Cartel, I think in 2003 or 2004, because we wanted to transition from cover covers to originals. And that's what you could do in Australia. Like, uh, you know, uh, In Excess did it, like uh, Cold Chisel did it, like ACDC used to play at the local pub down the road. You know, it was like, it was like even the Beatles did two years in Hamburg in like Germany, yeah. like playing covers. You know what I mean? So like that was kind of like the transition wasn't that out of reach. And then we just yeah. started like doing it professionally, I guess. And we, we got on like with, with Nickelback and Taste the Chaos. So um, I was gonna, at what point did you find that the band started to pick up momentum that you started to kind of get set apart from the other local bands? It was literally 2005, the year that I auditioned for Rockstar. Like there was, it was that year when we had like, uh, like we had Save Me, or like we had a song called Fire Sign that was like kind of on a on a surf film or something like that. And it was like, there was like a little buzz. We had a song that uh, called um, Falling. I think that was on when... Adam Levine's band had uh, Harder to Breathe. Like, we had, like, a, a song on the radio at the same time. Yeah. And then we were, like, so I started taking, and that's when the opportunity came, where I, when they called me back and said, you, I think you're going to be in the final for this audition. Yeah. And I go, guys, let me just take it and see how far I can go. And I just kept on going. And I was like, oh, shit. So I remember, remember Toby saying, uh, you know, we we're doing really well, kind of just what you said there, and, and uh, Toby came in and said, I'm going to audition for this TV show. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's <a> accent. <laughs> but it was just like, he's like, I didn't get it at all. I was totally yeah. against it initially. But you obviously, he says, to be fair to yourself, you, from day one you'd said, this is, we're using this as a launch pad for the band, and you stuck to your guns. Yeah. He, he says everything that happened was exactly what you said would happen mm. you know and, and he'd said that because I'd said to him you guys are all based in Australia you're obviously over in uh, I'm assuming Los Angeles filming yeah. I says was it easy at that time for everyone to down tools when you'd said listen I'm going to come in runner up third whatever it was get yourselves over here and Tommy said, my bags were already packed. He says, yeah. I had a decent job. I was making okay money. He says, but I was in my late 20s or whatever it was. And, you know, he says, my bags were packed and, and, and I was I was heading out there. And um, so see, in hindsight, was it obvious that the band had, had the potential? Or do you think the band would have got out of Australia without you being on the show? I, it would have been. I think it would have been kind of tough, only because like we in Australia. I think it might it might happen in Scotland as well. But like, if you were a, like a really well known cover band and then you go to originals, there there is a little bit of like, what the fuck are you you're trying to do? Like, why weren't you just always original? You know, um, yeah. like, but because we're not in the seventies anymore. Like, we're in like the early two thousands, where it's like, no, you you choose one or the other. You know. Um, it might have just it, it could have been good, but I feel like the experience of like, like the opportunity that we got, we got to stretch our legs a lot more. Like I think I, I won um, like a car for throw it away, and so I cashed that car in and put that the funds towards getting everyone out to America, and that that was part of the deal, you know, and to make sure we all felt secure coming in, and we had like a team looking after us a little bit, but it's. It wasn't like glitz and glamour as well, you know. It's like what? Uh, what about the two guitars that you, you were gifted on the show? Did you get to keep them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, I got the the SG is uh, in the, in my studio at the back, which where where the Wi Fi wasn't working, and then we had that awesome forty minute conversation about how shit I am at Wi Fi. Um, 
it's out there. And Dale borrowed it. Um, and, and he, because he loved, he plays SG like a motherfucker. I saw it. He used to, he borrowed it. And then I remember we were like in Dallas and, and, and he goes, he goes, Tobes, the guitar's not coming. I go, why? And he goes, well, I just got told that the airplane ran over it. So I left it in his, in his trust and he, and they broke that, that SG neck. He felt so bad, but I have those guitars still. Yeah. The same with Jake Cartel. Why did Jake Cartel work? And I, and I don't mean in, in terms of success. What made the band work? So I had asked Tommy the same question. Mm. The, the way I put it to him was, my personal opinion, you've got a band, you've got four or five members. You need to have a leader or maybe, maybe two leaders, but the band needs to have someone steering the ship. Mm. Uh, the other guys in the band need to be okay with getting behind that, trusting that person's direction, get behind it and supporting it. I don't think it works if that's not the case. And Tommy did say that he felt the reason it worked was everybody had a had a position in the band, whether it, you know, he said you were kind of like the main songwriter. Of course, everybody was open to, you know, trying things. He mm-hmm. said you were the main songwriter. I can't remember the other things, you know, somebody was good at networking, somebody was good at this, somebody was good at that. But he says, when you then combined that, it just made this solid unit. Everybody contributed something that made the band dynamic better. But would you agree you you do need someone leading, steering the ship? Yeah, I, I, like, I guess I kind of like adopted that role because of the success of the show, whatever. But I never felt like a leader, you know, our, our rhythm guitarist Todd was probably more of a leader because he was he was the books man. Like everything was like you know put yeah. in order. And in hindsight, like I, I was I was kind of an emotional pushover. Like if if someone said like even to this day if someone goes I'm not sure I'm like why you know like I'm not a bulldog. I don't go fucking do this. Um, I'm always open for interpretation. But sometimes I'm like you know what like. I think it came to some points where I was like, I did the groundwork, so you have to fucking trust me, you know, or yeah. whatever it is. And and I trusted the fact that Dale is just, you know, going to always be on point. I trust that Tommy's going to be the social butterfly that everyone's going to fall in love with and his, his feel. Like, um, I kind of wish we were a four-piece, you know. I'm not, I'm not meaning being a dictator. What I'm meaning is leading and everybody... Yeah. Every- I mean, everyone's contributing to make the yeah. overall better, but uh, it's one of those things that I suppose if you can leave ego at the door, it helps because it destroys so many bands. But uh, one thing that the band had done now, you had texted me about this and I completely forgot to speak to J-Bro about it, was the, the song Brightest Star. But I, I, I did speak to him when the camera was switched off about it. And I'd said to him, listen, I'm, I'm going to speak to Toby about it. Are you okay with that? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. So how did they, how did that come about? Was that like completely written brand new or was that riff kicking about prior to it, the no, it, was, you- it was It was written for, for, for Jay's mum. Like it literally, um, I've always, like my best friends are like mainly women in Australia, like, like, awesome i have such awesome like girlfriends you know like who are and so when jay bro we were at the hotel cafe doing like an acoustic show which is an awesome venue in la and we went out he was smoking at the time and he goes he goes mate um i just found out mum's got breast cancer i said well okay let's fucking write her a song dude and i went over to his house like i think the next week and started writing ideas like like lyrics and then he would oversee them and go, yeah, that relates to mum, you know, and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Obviously a little abstract because we're not, we're not going to say, this is Jay's mum, we love you. It, it's like, yeah. it was like a universal language, whatever it was. But I remember writing, every time that I had like a new draft, I would show Jay for his mm-hmm. blessing about his mum, you know, yeah. and that's how it came about, you know. And so we, we worked with the Komen Foundation, Foundation out here. Um, you know, Playboy Radio had us on because, you know, they're all about boobs and, you know, looking after the, you know, they, they are. They're like so yeah. many women who are like, you know, beautiful women. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are. You, you can 
you can get cancer, you know. And so we use that platform to like ins- inspire, I guess. And it, I, we yeah. didn't really, do, we didn't really do it for any other reason for that actually. And it was for his mum, yeah. What about the the music video? Where are you playing? Who who are you playing to? At the, the venues we're playing. No, no. So the, in the the music video for that song. Oh, Oh yeah, yeah. It looks like you're sitting. You're you're playing to. Uh, is that all your mums or who no, was these, it? Were- the local community for Komen. We went and visited all these girls who were going through chemo, and we said, "Do you mind coming to our studio, and we're going to film it?" And they were all with cancer. All, all of those, all those ladies had cancer, and uh, Stephanie, who was the pioneer, she was a couple of years younger than me. She passed away like three years later. It, is it, is that wild. the box in the middle? What's that, mate? Is that the one that sort of, there's a bit in the middle of the song where it kind of cuts away and she, there's someone talking? Is, is that the one you're talking about? Not her, no. She, the, oh, she's no. alive, which is amazing. But it's just, it's like, you know, when you see something like that, it, it was actually real shit. And I was in the room going, like, really moved by it. And it was, yeah, and it was all because of Jay Bro like worrying about his mum, you know. Yeah, but it's true what you're saying though, because the song's obviously inspired by Jay's mum. Mm. But it's I don't mean vague enough, but it's it's not directly about her. So I mm. I, I think it was, I don't know if it was yourself I'd spoke to, but uh, my my dad unfortunately passed away from cancer in December there which is part of the reason why the, the podcast exists right and uh, but I can relate to the, the song you know thinking about him even yeah. though this was originally written for for Jay's mum but I mean it can apply to anybody it's that that's, but that's, the, but that's but that, and that's and that's the thing about that's why we're musicians aren't we because the interpretation is like when you hear like uh storytelling when uh you hear how Wonder Wall was written or like whatever. And they're like, we just, you know, sometimes it's just like throwing shit at a wall, but sometimes it's actually, it, it actually was meant intentionally for people who need to feel something like a uh, fix you by Coldplay. You know, every time that song, like, I hear it, I'm like, you motherfuckers got me. You know what I mean? Like whatever I'm, fi- what it, yeah. But the brightest stars clearly about a certain subject matter. Yeah. You're t- about Wonderwall, I remember watching a documentary and it was Oasis and they're in the studio and four of them decide to go, you know, round to the pub for a drink and they come back 20 minutes later and Noel Gallagher wrote Champagne Supernova. <laughs> right? And and he say, he'd said, uh, someone had asked him, what does it mean? And he'd said, I, I don't know what it means. He says, I, I don't need to know what it means because when I play it on stage and 50,000 people sing it back to me, it means something to every one of them and that's all that matters. So that there is some songs that are about a specific subject and it's great, but the beauty of music is there's some songs, you could go and ask those 50,000 people and they would all give you a different answer. Yeah, and that's that's the joy of it as well. Like I love that. You know, when uh, when you submit music these days on a platform, they go... What's the song about? It's kind of all. It's almost like, what? What's the song about to you? You know what I mean? Like, like I don't want to tell you how to feel about the music. You know, when I hear new music from my favorite bands, I I don't want them to t- explain to me how they think about it, unless maybe down the down the road. But I want to understand what it makes me feel like. You know, yeah. Yeah. I think I remember hearing uh, Jim Morrison from the Doors mm. refused that question whenever it was asked what, what's this song about because he says the minute I say this is what I think it's about that's what you think it's about you get you isolate your audience all of a sudden because <laughs> well I don't relate to that now it's like no it's this is my my music that your interpretation is is going to get the vessel you know although maybe by the time he was he was so drugged out his head <laughs> he didn't yeah, <laughs> Did, was his back turned he's like don't talk to me you know like, yeah. <laughs> right. that's but awesome. Obviously, Duke Cartel, the band came to an end. I know that there was problems with management. Tommy had said to me, and you kind of said a wee bit about this, you know, it wasn't 
as glamorous as you would think. You know, yeah. you've got a record deal. You're you're doing tours. You're doing radio shows. You've got a residency at the Viper Room. He says, but we were absolutely skint because of the type of visa that we were on. He says we couldn't go and get day jobs. He said yeah. you could make job cash in hand, which we. You know, he didn't really do. He said something about some texting thing. I, I didn't know what he was talking about. Oh, yeah, he, he was, did some weird shit. Like, yeah. yeah, but he, he was, was saying, he was just saying that you would go to the to the shop to buy some food, and you would be worried that you couldn't afford. That like you'd maybe have to put things back, and and uh, he had said that for two or three years from when the show, when you finished on the show, he said every day he woke up, it was like a dream. He was pinching himself. He was saying, yeah. either we're going from, you know, the next step, the next step, he says, it was going up and up and up. And then he said, it just got to a point where it just stopped. He said, it didn't feel like we were going to get any further. Yeah. Not quite sure why. And then he says, you know, we weren't in our, uh, weren't in our late 20s. We were now in our mid 30s. Yeah. Uh, you know, your skin, you, you don't have uh, any money, you know, I don't know if Dale had had uh, kids or in by that point, but you get you get to a stage where you're like, if this isn't happening, I, I need to change and do something else. Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of how the band ended? Yeah, it was. The responsibilities changed. You know, like it was like it wasn't as like exciting. You know, and because we would we were every every person that we were be like a, like a management or or someone who came on board was like, you guys are the shit. But it was like, how do we get to that next level of we're, yeah. we're, that step and like for me like if anyone knows me and I'm maybe the boys have said this before but I'm always like let's go you know what can we do yeah. you know like and 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 maybe to a fault sometimes because maybe I overwhelm the energy you know and I'm I'm aware that like what I want maybe not what others want you know and uh I'm old enough to like realize that now, but in the moment you're just like trying to keep your head above water, you know, and you don't want to go back to Australia because the market's not as big. You want to try and break through. Um, But things don't work out that way. And so our priorities change, you know. Remember Tommy saying he was, Tommy was saying that he was gutted. He says that he's had a meeting in a cafe with management and he says that the the final nail in the coffin is Jay, J Bro had said he was pretty much done by that point. Mm. AJ, I, I spoke with AJ as well. Mm. That that guy is unbelievably enthusiastic. He's like, yeah, and, and talented. See if if you could have four guys like him in your band, what what a band it would be. Yeah, he, he said he was he he was the only one that was he wanted to keep going regardless. Yeah, but. But he also understood that he joined the band later than everyone else, so it was maybe a bit more fresh for him, whereas everybody else had was it was kind of done. Yeah. So, like, if you have, like, uh, let's say you have fruit, right, and the core is not together, the fruits, it looks attractive, but it ain't going to taste that good. So the core wasn't, wasn't structured, like... Dale was like, man, I, I, I got to like think about, you know, I can't do this forever, you know. Yeah. Whereas I was like a, a bit of a vagabond. I was like, I, I'm, I'm open to like just fucking throw me into whatever airstream. And I loved working with AJ and his enthusiasm. But unless Tommy and Dale were like enthusiastic as well, it, it you know, and all of us, yeah. it, it, it doesn't make sense, you know. And that, and uh, yeah, man, it was like it was a weird, it was a yeah. One here's, a qu- here's a question for you, though, because you will remember from your Facebook live sessions, I think I, I put this question to you every time you've done it. And AJ confirmed that there was so much music recorded. When yeah. are you really? I know. <laughs> and that's the thing is like, it, and it's so fucking funny because we're all, we all go, yeah, let's, let's do it. But like, like, Oh man, I, f- I feel like I have like a thousand children that haven't haven't gone to school yet, you know, and that's part of the music. Because you've done that Lost Tapes, um, Lost, Lost Songs, yeah, Lost Songs, and uh, that had I don't know maybe five or six tracks on it. Yeah, but AJ had said there was loads of stuff recorded. Now, like so much good shit, dude. Like, I am 
Toby, like, come on, Toby. Or what you should do, Toby, is just send it directly to me. I <laughs> know. Oh, yeah. Do you want to like co-produce it with me and AJ? That'd be great. That'd be awesome. I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. Uh, is the is the door completely closed on Duke Cartel for the time being? Or I know that occasionally, if you, it's hard to do so. But if you, yeah, all the guys are in the same location, you are more than up for doing a gig. And uh, I spoke with the other guys, and, and they had said. They're always up for jamming. They're always up for writing songs. Yeah. They're in a position now where they're, they're not up for going touring for three or four months because they've got responsibilities now, which is, is fair enough. But is the door completely closed or do you see anything happening in the future with Duke Cartel, even if it's just releasing the, the, the songs recorded? Yeah, it definitely not closed for me. But um, I, if I'm not like the one pursuing it, it, it doesn't happen. That's right. that's kind of I've, under, I've I understand that it's not like I get a phone call from Dale every second week, you know, going, man, we got to put this song out, you know, or Tommy doing this. It's it's when I get in because I'm still, you know, like I'm still in the, in the creative flow. Like I think I'll always be, and and I'll have moments to myself in the studio, and I'll like listen to I have a folder of Duke Cartel songs unreleased, and I'll listen to them. I was I'll get like a couple of glasses of wine. And I'm like. We should fucking, you know, like I get all inspired. But yeah. that's because that's who I am. You know, they, those guys aren't there right now, you know. But I almost feel like if I led them there, they well, would do it. You know? All of them all of them agreed, though, that out of all of them, you're the one that, that is kind of took it to the next level and you're still pursuing that, whereas the rest of them took a step back. Yeah. You know, so... so it would be easier for them to just dip a foot in now and again. Yeah. Dip a toe. Oh, and but, they, 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 honestly, like, because Dale and Tommy are like two of the, my favourite people in the whole world. And they, they're like, yep, let me know. It, it's, yeah. it's literally just, it, it, it's up to me, you know, and that's kind of where it comes down. If I, if I go to Australia, you know, and we all get together, sure, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the cool thing is the band split up. But having spoke to everybody, with the exception of Dale, it, it didn't an, end on bad terms. No, nobody fell out. You know, everybody has said, you know, obviously Tommy, J. Bro are back in Australia. Dale's back there as well. AJ, I think, is still in LA. And it, yeah, yeah. I, I don't see, uh, I don't really cross paths with Toby. However, if we were to cross paths, brilliant. You know, we would sit and chat away and, yep. you know, would be absolutely great. So, but it's nice that he's didn't it didn't end badly in that in that sense. Yeah, no, and and that's the one thing I love about AJ is that like he's got three kids now as well. Like I, when I was at his house last year, we we listened to some of the songs and we, we were like, but but <laughs> but it's also like what you know? How do we fulfil that duty to the music when we have other responsibilities? You know, like you know and being in a band is more than just like throwing shit out there. It, it actually takes a conscious effort and a mental effort. And if it's not equal partnership, then you you kind of have to like go, what am I doing it for? You know, like, yeah. Is it weird that Duke Cartel, a band that started in Melbourne, Australia, it's known all over the, all over the world? Is, is that a strange thing well it's not known all over the i, I or, love you for that where yeah. would you where would you say your your i'm assuming your biggest fan base would probably be australia and yeah. america yeah yeah but I, we don't you know we don't actually get like the you know people knocking on the door as much but when i go back to australia it it's almost like oh, oh remember us you know what i mean like we're, we're not a band that you go i, well, I don't know I actually don't fucking know. It's, it's actually interesting to, to put it in that perspective because every time that I engage the the old Duke cartel thing, like all of a sudden people come out from nowhere. I'm like, oh, maybe we did some good shit, you know. Yeah. Where else in the world then do you do you hear from people? Um, Germany, uh, Frank Frankfurt in particular for some reason, uh, uh, <laughs> Iceland, uh, yep. and Canada. Uh, America and Brazil and Argentina 
Because in Brazil and Argentina, when the show was on, they didn't have a pixelated view when I ran around the pool naked. So they saw my whole ass and <laughs> so they were like, that was awesome. You did a nude run. Like other countries like, oh, it was blurred out. I'm like, you know, thank, thank God for you guys. <laughs> well, thank God for you. It, it wasn't filmed in Scotland because yeah, uh, no, they, they, they killed me. Like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So Jake Cartel, we'll see what happens. Uh, yep. Maybe the, the recordings will come out. If not, I'll just pester you and you, and you can. How are you, man? You, you, you're our new manager. Let's go. But, um, <laughs> You're obviously, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, two bands at the moment. So there's Radio XX and Ash and Moon. Yep. So Radio XX it, is like a, a, a corporate band, like a high-octane cover band. Yeah. Is that just cover songs? We've written 17 songs. Me and Boris. Yeah. And they're like so unique that I've never written like that before. Bryce obviously is, is well known for being in the band called Lifehouse and – he, he got his first break in a band called AM Radio. They opened up for like Weezer. He was buddies with those guys. He has like a very eclectic approach to music. He's a MI student, like Music Institute nerd. Um, and I'm like, a, I'm like the flame to his like nerd, you know. And so, yeah. yeah. How did you get in touch with those guys? How did that band come around? They, we've been friends since 2006, like, Ben and Bryce were in Lifehouse and they were watching the show on tour. And Ben, being an Australian, he was in Savage Garden as well. He goes, I've got to meet that guy one day. And literally two days later, I was walking down Sunset Strip and he goes, are you all that Australian? And I go, well, you sound Australian too. And we became buddies that night. I stayed at his house and he was living with Phil Collin from Def Leppard, the guitarist. Really? Okay. Like, I stayed at his house that night. I'm like... I think I like Los Angeles, you know, and, and we've been buddies ever since. And we during COVID, we started the band because we had no jobs. We're like, let's, let's do this. And it snowballed, yeah. Is that the one that you, you seem to go between LA and Vegas? Is, is Vegas. it for that? Yep. So we have a residency yep. at the Cosmopolitan in Vegas. Yeah. And uh, so we play there every other Saturday. And then we, we I'm flying to Cancun on Thursday for like corporate events and things like that. So we just... Yeah, travel. So uh, I'm assuming it's trying to find time, but there will be an album or something will come out from that Rich. band at some point. We're trying to convince Ben that me and Bryce are writing some good shit. Like he's like kind of burnt <laughs> out with like trying to do the original thing with his uh, other band that he was in. So me and Bryce are just like in the in the in the back corner writing like awesome tracks. It's really fun, and then. Yeah. I'm writing with Ash and Moon and then my solo project as well. Yeah. So how did that win come about? Um, I was asked to go and sing with a super group. It was like Gary, B Gary, obviously from In Excess. We had Dave Navarro. We had Terry from Bern Berlin. Um, we had the keyboard player from Jane's Addiction uh, and they needed another singer. And so I went and did the, this gig and me and Gary hit it off as Aussies. Mm -hmm. And he goes, mate, we should, we should do a, like a, another band together. And then I go, we should write songs. And then he opened up his old vault from the 90s when he, the songs that In Excess never recorded. Right. And we converted them into tracks. Yeah. All right. Yeah, which is pretty, for me, I was like, this is awesome. You know, like. I know you've just released the, the first, well, it's not the first single, but it's the, the new single. Is that on the back? Is there an album coming out on the back of that? Yeah, we have like, uh, I think, seven tracks already recorded. And we get, we're, we're doing the same thing, dude. I'm sorry. Single, single, you know, <laughs> it's like this bullshit strategic plan. But, um, yeah, that's just the way it is, man. So we're, we're just rolling it out. Like I said, I'm not trying to, like, conquer the world. I need to get my music out. And I want to, like, do it in the best pos possible way. And hopefully people like it. If they don't, it's okay. <laughs> And for Ash and Moon, what, what's the songwriting process? So, I mean, you're saying the, um, the Gary had a bit of a vault of yep. song ideas, riffs, things like that. Mm -hmm. Is he really working on them or, or is he happy for others to contribute new stuff just now and see what happens? Can, all, all four corners are now open. It was just like we had to get some of those things that I think he was holding on to mm -hmm. and some of the things I was holding on to and we combined. And now 
it's an open forum for the whole band. We actually just structured a deal with all of us being equal members. So that's what we're trying to look forward to. Here's a question then. You obviously do songwriting, recording, performing. If you had to pick songwriting and recording only or performing only for the rest of your days, which one would you pick? How dare you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Ah, shit. I think that songwriting actually makes me who I am. Yeah. And performing is the bonus. So I would probably choose songwriting. Yeah, I I mean, I think I'd do the same because I think it would irritate me if there were songs in there that I, I couldn't get out oh, I think I'd just be like a stupid piece of asshole sitting on the couch going with no creative flow like I think I, I enjoyed the creative flow yeah if I wasn't had didn't have this creative flow I wouldn't be the person I was you know what I mean so yeah that's but now I don't actually get I don't have any fear of the stage I don't, I don't get nervous anymore I, they come yeah. with age you know what I mean like the more that you're playing and singing yourself it, the, easy, it, the more innate it is, I get more nervous doing a fucking live stream because I'm worried it's going to glitch like this shit, you know what I mean? So, well, it's funny what you were saying when you, when you were speaking with Mark about singing, you don't get nervous and, hmm. uh, you know, you've got to just keep, you, you've got to do it so many times, but I do get jealous when I see yourself and others performing over there because it seems like such a different culture set up with regard to playing. Like, it feels really... Very rough over here. Mm. When you when you go in, obviously it's not you know it's not nearly as big a scale you know. But yeah. if you go in pubs, it, it, it is a tough game. I know. <laughs> but if, for instance, if you came and visited us, and you, I would give you that experience because that's what Vegas is like. It's a gymnasium. It's like where you get to like literally stretch your legs and go. You know what? I've got a transient crowd. I'm going to fucking throw whatever it is, you know, at you. I, I think the impression that I get from watching it, though, is the places that you're playing, like, let's talk about the small ones. They're still they're set up for music, so there's a bit that the band sets up in and people are going along to actually see it. Yep. When you're playing in Scotland, you're going along to a pub. It's basically, right, there's a corner over there. Yep. Yeah set up people are here regardless of you and you you need to grow a thick skin <laughs> yeah to, yeah yeah the vibe over here that you've got because there's a very big drinking culture but uh you know you, you basically meet every type of person i mean it was it was only at the start of the year i'm in my 40s now and i was i was threatening so, someday i had to stop a song and uh, and ask the guy to, to step outside um, and I'm like, I am at least 20 years too old for this. Yeah, but, you're like, what am I doing, man? So, like, and, so and, you, you see, you see, like, the, but this is the version of myself that I'm, I'm allowing myself to enjoy. I don't, I don't want to be on stage unless I'm doing those things, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm 46 years old. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to be, you know, in the corner, you know, but that's okay because I started in the corner, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just in an evolution of someone in the corner, you know, so mm-hmm. everyone has to be that version. You, you yeah, don't I mean, go onto the big stage straight away, you know what I mean? It so depends, depends what you're doing. If you're, like, what I do at the moment is, is I'm just, this is playing cover songs in a pub, this is just a way of making some extra cash. But there is, if you've got an original band or original songwriter, there's places you can go and you get a good reception and there's a stage set up. It depends which one you want to go for. If you want the one where you're making regular money, you've got to be tough. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. I get it. I'm, yeah. Mate, I'm going through it this week here in LA where they're like, you kind of have to pay to play at these venues. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I don't. I, I'm just like, you know, like. You- that, that thing here, I, I've not, that's still a thing here where, where they will say to you, if you're playing in a band, We'll give you 50 tickets. We'll take the money from the first 30 and then you take the money from whatever after that. Now, most people are not going to be able to bring 30 people, let alone 50 people. So what most bands will do is they'll give the tickets away for free with it, and the band will play 
they'll well pay to play yep. with the hope that they'll bring people in with free tickets. It, and it's it's terrible. It's a horrible way to to work. And you know, I don't know if it, if it's changed any. It used to be like that through in Glasgow, but um, it's, it's, a happen- it's it's happening again here. You know, like there was a sweet spot where it was like we need like people were just billowing into this into these venues. But people aren't yeah. going to these venues anymore. They're not they're not lining up out the door. So yeah. So these promoters and these kind of owners, they need to like come up with st- strategic pl- plans to keep the doors open. And yeah. unfortunately, um, music is a hobby to some people, and we we're, we're the first ones that get like, you know, nickel and dime. You know. Uh, Meanwhile, they're that- charging fifteen dollars for a fucking bourbon and coke. You know. So it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, wild. Uh, is this um? on the back of COVID because what, what I found in Scotland is there, unfortunately there was a lot of places closed down they couldn't yeah. survive and it, but the places that, that remained they're up and running and live music's really coming back but the problem you're finding is there's not as many people going out now because yeah. living expenses are so high yeah yeah. The, the, the remote living is you know even I never thought I'd be like an online shopper but you know it's what it's weird I'm like but people now, yeah, like they, they don't go out as much. Like it's definitely yeah. happening, particularly on the Sunset Strip. It's, mm-hmm. There's like a up and down the strip like it used to be when, when we were playing 2006, 2007. It was, you couldn't, you were just immersed with like this awesome, and you'd, you'd go to the, the, the cat house and there was, you know, like some of your favourite musicians just jamming. Now yeah. it's like just TikTokers going, this used to be, you know, the rainbow, you know, whatever it is, you know. So it's not as not as billowing as it used to be, yeah. I've, I've only ever been in, in Los Angeles once, and it was back in 2001, something like that. Good times, good times. And, uh, and I can remember going to the whiskey in the Viper room across the road. And yeah, all that. man. Going to any speech. And, uh, and it was, you had uh, a good time, didn't you? Did you have a good time? Yeah. It was a yeah, cool man. place. That's when Bob Revolver came together, Audio Slave, Rock and Roll was like doing this big resurgence. There was like it was mm-hmm. epic. Like it was like it was like the cool version of the eighties and the early two thousands. Everyone was just like yeah. fucking sexy and cool, and it was great. Yeah. It was, we've only got a few more questions, right? So up to this point, we've obviously been quite serious. A lot of talk, technical talk about all your previous bands. Um, about Rockstar Supernova, about yourself being a wee choir boy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, mate. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to end things with some fun questions to find out about the man behind the myth. Shit. <laughs> I saw I saw you do this with Jay Brown. He's like, oh, you're like you're freaking out. Like, it's like no, no, I've not got any Scottish Scottish words for you. But uh, yeah. maybe, maybe next time we'll do that. So. Just some random questions for you. Mm-hmm. Give me a few of your favourite movies. Uh, Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Which is uh, Braveheart and Gladiator. Freedom! Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the, and, and the thing is, like, I met Mel Gibson one night and it was just after he was an asshole and it was like, it just really sucked. But anyway, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> oh, over, here, over here we think of him as a legend <laughs> yeah, I know he is He'll always be William Wallace to you guys I, get yeah. it. I, I, I love old Mel but yeah. See if you weren't a musician if you, if you didn't do it at all What would be another career? What would be a job you think that you would quite like to do? I would like to be behind In, in, the, in the dugout with a sport, sporting team So like uh, a coach. Managing like a sporting club Or like looking after the players And saying you know how do we Kind of like the Ted Lasso thing. I'd be be it from Ted Lasso, you know, like helping okay. the coach organise shit. Yeah. Got a couple of questions from your previous uh, bandmates. <laughs> oh fuck! Here we go. <laughs> I don't even understand this one, so hopefully it makes sense to yourself. J Bro would like to know. I have to ask you about ships and tugboats. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is awesome. <laughs> So I came up with a sound. Um, it actually came from Revenge of the Nerds. So when when the nerds saw 
uh, Betty. It was like a Betty. So like a beautiful girl come in, they'd be like. I, I know the film. You, it's my favorite film of all time. It's fucking awesome. Right. So I call them ships. So like, look, this is like, look what the ship brought in, you know? Yeah. So I came, up, I came up with like, so when like a, a beautiful girl, like my, 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 my girl Kia, the first time I met her, I was like, she's like making fuck <laughs> fart sounds. What the hell are you doing? But it's like a ship is coming in. Right. And then J boat Bray was like, but what about the tugboats who pulled it in? And I'm like, yeah, that's the ugly friend. So, so J- I, I, I say J bro came up with the tugboat, but I'm, I'm the shit. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever, I don't know if it's shown out there, but there's a, there was a, a British TV program called Peep Show. Oh shit, no. And it was a, uh, it was two, two guys in their, their thirties living together one of them's obviously wears the suit, he goes to work, he's quite prim and proper. And uh, the other one just sits at home all day taking drugs and drinking and like sleeping with loads of women and stuff like that. And, and that was their thing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, exactly. And like men behaving badly as well, like that TV show, like all that. Yeah, it was the same. I, I always say that the Great Britain has the best humour. I grew up with my, my father being British and he, he went to school with John Cleese, so... Monty right. Python was really big for us. And actually, my father's best friend was Stephen Hawking in, in, in Cambridge. So I failed um, in science world, in my father's eyes. But that's but, but the humour in the 60s and, and, and that culture of British humour is a lot of Americans don't get it, you know, the, the slapstick banter, you know. Yeah. He's not the messiah. He's just a naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> we are the knights of neat. Yeah, it's so good. Spoke with Tommy. Went into a lot of detail with Tommy about like, songwriting and the mm-hmm. way the band liked to record. Uh, so with that in mind, Tommy's question was, who got more attention from the ladies back in the day? Was it himself or you? <laughs> Definitely him. <laughs> but what are you talking about recording? See, you know what I mean? Like, the only thing he can talk about recording and writing is that what he was trying to, like, do afterwards it's amazing the best no, yeah. one the best one I was talking with Tommy and he'd said uh, for a while there when they were in Los Angeles he says it was great he's getting recognised he's like I'd be walking down the street and there'd be a girl would be like oh you you Tommy from that Duke cartel and be like fuck yeah what do you want what do you want to do about it <laughs> did he really say that he's a he's a fucking liar <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, I, I love him to death. Like, yeah, but he had, dude, Tommy's a stud. See, this, the, the funny thing with Tommy as well, obviously he's, he's, he's a way, way over there in Australia. His girlfriend, we were talking about family before we started to record, hmm. and his girlfriend is from Ireland. His fiance, yeah, from Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, because we were saying, he was talking about the accent, and I'm saying, listen, you 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 live with an, a girl from Ireland. You must be used to like hearing a terrible accent. And he's like, yeah, yeah, same, same, whatever. And uh, it turns out that his his fiance's from the same little town in Ireland that my auntie and uncle and cousins all live. Bullshit. No, it, it's it's. You gotta crazy. get the, you gotta get the dirt, man. And like, yeah, let's find out why she she ran away. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> because of my family but the thing is Tommy wouldn't even know if she had an accent because he doesn't listen so, <laughs> he's like when I when we first joined a band together he had an, an Ampeg 8x10 with a, with a head and he bought a fucking MX-5 car with no room to put anything in. and he goes well you have a Subaru so I can just put it in that I'm like you fucking <laughs> selfish prick <laughs> I love him so much. I, I, was, I was talking to him yesterday, so it was his birthday two days ago. And it's AJ's birthday today, or yesterday, yeah, as well. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Another question for you. Imagine you've got a time machine. You could go, you could go to anywhere in the world. Small gig, big gig, whatever. What's the one concert that you wish you could have attended? Oh, wow. Um, I think... Um, when you two went back to Ireland after Bono's dad passed away, I think it was Slang Castle. All right, it was, okay. 
he played in Boston because the show has to go on, his father would always say. And then when he brought that emotion back to Slane, it, it, it was like, it, it looked to me from what I saw, like church, you know, like my yeah. version of church. I don't go to church myself, but no. th- to me that was like, there was like 120,000 people or something. And we did a beautiful day, like the lights went up and, you know, and then he was, there was his father just passed. He was, like he, his father was a baritone, like incredible singer. Yep. You know, yeah, that would have been for me. Yeah, yep. there is millions and millions of great songs have been written and recorded over the years. What's the one song you wish you could have sat in the recording studio behind the desk to watch it being recorded? That's fucking wild. I think um, not necessarily a song, but I would have loved to have been there when Jeff Buckley was like cutting his record. Yeah, he was twenty six years old. I think like that album Grace, like just to watch because I think most of it was just live one take kind of shit, you know. And because I I still remember the day he passed away, I was playing football in the street uh, with a friend of mine and my brother Simon. In, in, incredibly inspired by Tom York, Jeff Buckley, you know, all those beautiful falsetto so- songwriters. Yep. He was bawling his eyes out and I didn't see him for three days. He just fucking left, you know. It, so yep. I would have loved to be in the studio to see Buckley do that shit, yeah. Yep. Here's one. That, uh, this might put um, somebody in the hot seat. So we'll, we'll go with Duke Cartel since we've, we've spoke quite a, a lot about them. So we've got Tommy on bass. Dale on guitar, we've got AJ keyboard guitar, mm-hmm. and we've got uh, who do I miss? J Bro drums. Yeah, left-handed drummer. Yeah. So, imagine Toby. It's four o'clock in the morning. A dead body in the boot of your car. You need to get rid of this dead body. You need to dispose of it. No questions asked. Which member of that band are you for? J Bro. <laughs> Did I you ask why? Because there's a quote that says, "Let's kill a, let's kill two birds with one stone." He goes, he goes, "Fuck that, let's kill one bird with five stones." <laughs> That's what Jay Bro said to me once, and I'm like, I, I think, I, I think you told me to ask him that on the, on the, the yeah, podcast. exactly. Like that to me, I'm like, he, he'd be like, what, what, what do I need to do? You know, where do I where do I put it? How do I wash my hands? Let's go. You know, or, or what someone had said was, depending on what age, yeah, the older you get, it's who's most likely to answer their phone at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good point, actually. <laughs> my phone's on silent, but yeah. I'd be the one calling. I think you know, that's it'd be my dead body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then last question, um, Mount Rushmore. Who are the four bands for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performing, whether it be the overall package? Who are the four bands for yourself? Um, Up in the pile. Uh, I put, I, I think, you, yeah, you two, obviously. Um, I would put, um, I'm, I'm a Zep fan, actually, Led Zeppelin. Right. I, I, uh, only because now I can actually sing like Robert. I couldn't in the past, so that was nice. I, I didn't like them because I couldn't sing like him but now I can so that's nice um Jesus oh man it's, it's a tough one um Radiohead Radiohead yeah um and then uh and then whatever band J Bro's in now let's do that <laughs> I'll, I'll it's too hard it's just very it's a hard I mean what, what's your what's your for I'd, I'd like to know that my, my four, the doors, I've got to be up there. Mm. And, and it blows my mind because I, I don't know how long has it been since 71, 50 years. Yeah. They were only together for four years and there's still never a bad sound like them. Like the Beatles, oh. man. Beatles, Beatles only crushed four years, you yeah. know. Like, crazy. Probably be, um, it'd probably be the doors, Metallica. Mm. Probably Iron Maiden. Oof. 
fighting Dark. Iron Maiden with Metallica. How dare you? Yeah. And um, there is a, you've probably never heard of him, there's a, a singer called Nick Drake. Okay. You heard of him? So no. he, he, he was. Send me the link after this. Yeah. Yeah. He was this English um, folk singer. Uh, well, it, it was classed as folk. I don't know if it would be folk music uh, back in the seventies. And he only he, he recorded three albums, and, and sadly committed suicide when he was like twenty four or something like that. Like really young. Never performed ever. He, he, he had I don't know what you call it, but it, it just the nerves. Of performing stopped him from performing so he recorded three albums and they, they weren't successful obviously when they released them but as years have went on they became like cult classics almost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and this guy guitar playing was outstanding and he's singing his songwriting his lyrics were were beautiful absolutely amazing and what a talent to you know, if it had been in this day and age, you could have probably got help, you know, yeah. to... Yeah, yeah, uh, because it was, it, was, it was taboo back then, you, you couldn't talk about it. Yeah. yeah, and his, his third album that he'd done, because he got session guys in to add the drums and all the bits and pieces, but his third album that he'd done, which is probably his best, was just him on an acoustic guitar s singing. Mm. And when he'd, he recorded it in the studio, he had a producer who produced his three albums. He couldn't even look at them. When recording, he had to turn and face the other way. Yeah. He, was, he was that unbelievably shy. Mm -hmm. But for someone to be that shy, but to be that talented, it's it's absolutely amazing. This well, I, I, you know what it is, though? Because in our day and age, we're used to people being talented and actually being more talented about showing off how talented they are, right? Whereas... The people you're attracted to, like people like I, I adore, like Buckley or Tom York, right, or Cornell, Chris Cornell, it's because they're without even like saying "Here I am," you're mm -hmm. engaged, and yeah. that's why they are so insular. Is because they don't have to go "Here I am," "Hey, la di da," yeah. they would just naturally get. And so this this person you're talking about, which I can't wait to hear, mm -hmm. he's. He wasn't doing it for any other reason. It was part of it. It's like me saying, do I prefer stage or songwriting? Yeah. He would choose songwriting because otherwise he would be a numb, void. Like, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't be anything, you know. And that, yeah. I love your questions because I relate to them, you know, in different ways. And it's, it's awesome, yeah. Cool, man. Well, Toby, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you at long last after 16 years. <laughs> I know, it's so funny. And you look exactly the same. You're like the Scottish Chris Daughtry. That's what you are. <laughs> yeah. I saw Mark stole my look. <laughs> yeah, Mark, I know. I remember when Marky shaved his head for the first time, he goes, mate, I just have to fucking do it. I go, don't yeah. worry, you'll be all right, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny? I, I, I played a gig through in Stirling uh, on Saturday there. I think I'd actually text you. I'd, I'd done a gig a few weeks ago, and the view that I had was of Wallace's Monument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, they asked me to come back and play again, so I, I was playing there on Saturday, and I'd went in, I'd set up everything, and then they'd said to me, is there any chance you could delay it for an hour? Uh, just because they were waiting on people coming in and that, that. So I was like, yeah, it's fine. I said, I need to actually go up into the city to, I need to go around a few pubs and speak to, to bits and pieces. So I went up, and uh, I met my friend. He was actually playing a gig. So I was standing talking to him, and he was asking me about the podcast. He's not he's not been on it yet, but I've seen listen, you yeah. need to come on and he was talking, oh he's like, I don't play rock music. I was like, it's not it's not to do it with rock music. I only picked that name because it rhymes. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, hey, get you to come on and I was telling him about different people that I had come on. He's like, Oh, that sounds really, really good. And I forgot all about Mark, right? And then he phoned me yesterday and I says, mate. I totally forgot to tell you, guess who I've got coming on next week? And he's like, who? I was like, I'm going to give you a clue. I was like, think Australia. <laughs> and automatically he's like, has it got something to do with Home and Away? <laughs> yes, it's the break. Right? It's break. And then I went, he's like, is it, is it Alf Stewart? I was like, mate, Alf Stewart isn't a, isn't a singer. I says, but 
think of a, a, a relation to Al Stewart. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and you know what? He actually guessed it. And I said to him, do you watch Home and Away? And he went, no, I've not watched it in like about 20 years. But he actually knew who I was talking about. Because he's he, like, that was the last time he would have seen Rick. It was, was, yeah. That, that's but awesome. He's, He's like, I remember that guy. He's like, he's like, was he not like a a bare knuckle fighter or something? I was like, I think there maybe was some ridiculous <laughs> storyline uh, like that. He's like, that's absolutely amazing. He's like, can you ask him about Alf Stewart? Alf Stewart's like a, li- a living legend. Oh, dude. He's like, you fucking flaming galah. You know, like, <laughs> he's the best, mate. Is, is, is Mark coming on your show? He's coming on, I think, next Wednesday. That's awesome, man. I love it. He's like one of my favorite people. He's like, you know, really awesome. You're like, it's so cool. I seen that he'd done the podcast. And I'm like, damn it, I'm going to have to watch this now because he might have nicked all my questions. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> this is the thing, though. Like, I'm getting to know you at the same time. So I was catching up with Mark, and then we, we, we there was no, there was no plan. Um, yeah. He just happened to become like when I when I first knew him. He was starting to sing, but now he has like a exciting range, and yeah. so it, that's how our, our conversation transitioned. You know, um, because I need to let him know that it, it isn't glitz and glamour. You know, the, the hard work has to be done. You know, and that's as, yeah. as, well. I was going to say I'll ask him. I was going to say, but is, is he still doing acting, or is it just music he does now? Mainly, mainly music. Yeah, yeah, and 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 just. I don't know. The, you 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 have a conversation with him. His disposition, the way that he, like, I'm just like really, I'm proud of the kid. He's awesome. I, I say kid, but he's like a grown man. But you know, like, like I prefer us at this age than we were when we're like late twenties. You know, everything yeah. seems so stressful. Now we're all just like it's composure. Probably you know. probably too much bravado back then. Yeah, I mean, it was because we weren't smart enough to go, we, don't, we shouldn't just give a fuck about the small things, man. We've got to live life, you know, and enjoy yeah. it. So. Bobby, thank you so much for coming on. It has been a pleasure to speak to you and to finally actually to meet you face to face. We got the technical issues out of the way. We got all the questions answered. <laughs> you're, you're leaving this, this uh, podcast with your dignity intact. Yeah, I appreciate Bobby. you, mate. Can you say hello to my, my little boy? Who's this? This is Bobby. This is Bowie. He's a beautiful boy. But that's because of the eyes. Yeah, David Bowie, heterochromia. Yeah. That's our boy. <laughs> he wants me to take him to the beach, so we're going to do that next. But I pre- appreciate yeah. you, man. It was awesome. Thank you.